find in your Bible, in God's Word tonight, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter number 14. Revelation chapter number 14. We're going to look at the first five verses tonight, and tonight's message is titled this, The Lamb and the 144,000. And uh, I look forward to sharing this with you, and I'm excited about preaching from Revelation chapter number 14 over the next couple weeks. And uh, I'd started to put all night, 20 verses into one message, but I didn't want to keep you for two hours. And uh, the nursery workers get weird when you do that for some reason. But uh, I want to share with you these first five verses. And when we get, come to chapter 14, the context is, is the end of the Great Tribulation. And we're going to see the 144,000 faithful Jewish witnesses in this passage of Scripture, with the Lamb, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you follow along with me, we'll read together. Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, And I looked, and lo, a Lamb stood on the mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his Father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed. From among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. We come to this passage of Scripture, and when we begin to see this, we meet with this interesting scene. It starts with, I looked and lo, a Lamb. Now, I want you to know who the Lamb is, the Lamb of God. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you're looking at the book of Revelation, uh, you're, you have John, the revelator, describing visions that God has given him. And he's looking in the future, and he's looking in this portion of Scripture. He's looking into the time at the end of the Great Tribulation, and he's looking and he's going to see the Lamb. The Lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ along with the lambs standing on Mount Zion, which is most likely the hills around Jerusalem. He sees with him, the Lamb, Jesus, an hundred and forty and four thousand. He sees a hundred and forty and four thousand having his Father's name written in their foreheads. And so we see this group of, of folks, and this is the first time we've seen them earlier in chapter number seven. We meet up with the hundred and forty four thousand, and they are Jewish. Uh, evangelists that God is going to use in a big way uh, in the great tribulation. These 144,000 are going to be responsible for leading great revival during the tribulation after the rapture of the church. And there are going to be multitudes of people who put their trust in Jesus Christ by faith as their Savior during the great tribulation. There's hope for folks uh, after the rapture who have not rejected Christ while in this church age. And I'm thankful for that. And if you're here and you've heard the gospel and rejected Christ, your opportunity to be saved after the rapture will be gone. The Bible teaches us that you will have your heart turned against God. Uh, but there's folks who are going to be saved, and it's exciting to know. I'm thankful to know this about Jesus Christ. I'm thankful to know this about Jesus, that he is long-suffering, and he is extending mercy as long as is possible and beyond. He is a, a God of great mercy. And so we have this 144,000 that God is going to use in a mighty way, and look what is in their foreheads. Uh, the Bible says that they have his Father's name written in their foreheads. Who's his? His is the Lamb. They've got the name of Jehovah God written in their foreheads. And I think that's quite interesting. Earlier in chapter number 13, we talked about the mark of the beast. Lots of folks worry about getting, and I hope I don't, uh, I don't, hope I don't get tricked in to taking the mark of the beast. You're not going to get tricked into taking the mark of the beast. If you're saved, 
Uh, you're not even going to be tempted to take the mark of the beast because the church is going to be gone when the whole mark of the beast thing is going on. But I do want you to know something, that this is how the devil works. The devil is all the time copying what God is doing. And when the devil copies something that, the, that God has done, he takes something that is good and wholesome and right, and he turns it into a perversion. And the mark that we hear, we talk about the mark of the beast, is a perversion of the good mark that God put in the foreheads of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses. That they bear the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse number 2, the Bible says, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. I like to read that phrase. Harpers harping with their harps. Uh, I like that verse. Uh, and really when you hear verse number 2, don't get, don't get so caught up it with thinking you can't understand it. I'm just going to explain to you verse number two. It was loud and exciting, and there was some singing going on that was and some music being played and, and the, the the singing and the, the worship that the hundred and forty four thousand with the lamb was doing was was loud and noticeable and outstanding. This group of 144,000, the Bible says in verse 3, they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 144, which were redeemed from the earth. There was this, the group, the 144,000, they were singing a song, a new song. They were singing the song of the redeemed. And uh, they were praising the Lord Jesus loudly and boldly. And the harps were harping. And it was an exciting moment because they were declaring that they were Redeemed. I like the word redeemed. Purchased. Redeemed. Uh, bought. Redeemed. Uh, made his own. And the Lord Jesus has made these 144,000 his very own. They're redeemed. And they're singing a song that says, I'm redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That They're crying out this song and it's a special song. And they're a special group. Let me talk to you about the 144,000 for just a moment. Have you ever heard anybody talk about being a part of the 144,000? There are all kinds of cult groups who believe that somehow their group is the special group of the 144,000. Let me tell you something. It just ain't so. The 144,000 are Jews. The 144,000 are Jewish witnesses that rise up during the tribulation. The 144,000 is not the church. The 144,000 is not some cultic group. The 144,000 is not some special group among a denomination. The 144,000 are just what the Bible says 144,000 are. They're Jewish witnesses, and God's going to use them during the tribulation for a very special time for a very special purpose, and they're going to sing glory and praise to God, and we have a record of it in chapter number 14. The Bible continues talking about the 144,000. They've sung the song, the song of the redeemed, and the Bible says in verse number 4, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Now, look, the Bible talks about these 144,000. The Bible says that they were them which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, I want you to know that I'm confident that these 144,000 were sexually pure followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to park here for just a moment. God has a law and a rule and a structure for human sexuality. Don't forget it. And just like the devil wants to pervert the mark in the forehead. The devil wants to pervert sexuality. God has designed human sexuality to be a great blessing to society. To be a motivator for family and family life. A structure and good and beautiful. 
even pleasurable, done in the right way, without regrets. The devil wants to take sexuality and he wants to make it something that is perverse. He wants to take it and make it something that it isn't. He wants Christian people to come to a place where they deny God's standard for human sexuality and they welcome and accept the devil's perversion. Now, I want you to understand something. The matter of human sexuality is a very, very powerful thing. Human sexuality and the drive that God has put naturally in the hearts of men and women. It's a very powerful thing. And if you corrupt human sexuality and take it out of the definition of God and God's Word, I want you to know it's something that destroys the very foundation of the society in which we live. If you study the history of pagan societies, one thing that every pagan society has in common is a perversion of human sexuality. Don't fall for the tricks and the lies of the devil that says it's perfectly okay for men to have sex with men, for women to have sex with women. It's perfectly okay. Look, That's a lie. It's an abomination to God. It's not right. Now, I want you to understand something. We do not hate sexual deviants. We don't hate the people. We hate the sin. And we cannot, we should not, and we will not, with God's help, accept as good and right and wholesome something that God has declared wrong. Sin is sin is sin is sin, and we must honor the Lord. When we come to this passage of Scripture, the Bible talks about these 144,000, and I'm confident that they were sexually pure according to God's standard, and that's wonderful and good. There's also a little deeper meaning to the emphasis here. The Bible says that they were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. There's an, also an emphasis here about the fact that these folks were not, uh, they were not idolatrous. And, and I say that with this in mind. I want you to keep your finger there in Revelation 14. And turn back just a few pages in your Bible to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. The Lord uses the idea of being chaste, being faithful to a spouse, to represent the relationship that we as Christians have with Christ our Savior. We shouldn't be cheating on our Savior with other gods, with idols and idolatry. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 2, the Bible says this, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you As a chaste virgin to Christ. Now look, we can understand that verse number 2 is not a direct correlation connection to actual human sexuality. But the faithfulness that God's people are to have to God himself. And when we look at the 144,000, I'm actually quite certain that the 144,000, though they were sexually pure, According to God's word, I think the main emphasis here was that the 144,000 were not idolaters. They were faithful to Christ and Christ alone. Their allegiance was one. All to Jesus. Only for Jesus. They were not idolaters. Scripture continues. Verse number 5. The Bible says, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The Bible says about these folks, they are without guile. In their mouth was no guile. I think that's such an important emphasis here. The Bible said that these folks, they were folks with mouths that were not full of deceit. Those are the 144,000. Now, the 144,000 is not the church. 
The 144,000 is not some denominational group or some cultic group that gets raised to some high standard. But the 144,000 that we see in Revelation chapter 14, no doubt, represent to us a group of people that in so many ways we should emulate. I've taken a few minutes and given you the interpretation of the Scripture. Now I'd like to take a minute and apply the Scripture. What's this mean for me? I want you to know something. You're not part of the 144,000, nor am I. But there are some things about the 144,000 that you and I should ask God to help us be like. Let me give you a list of five simple things. Number one, we should strive in our Christian lives to be like the 144,000 in the fact that, number one, they boldly wore the name of Jesus in their foreheads. Now, I'm not asking you to get a tattoo. Please don't. But I am asking you to be the kind of Christian who boldly wears the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's sad that we live in a time where you can't tell the Christians from the world. I think it's sad that we live in a time where Christian people who in their heart, the Lord Jesus redeemed them from their sin. The Lord Jesus bought and paid for them. God's changed their lives. They know they're saved. They know they're going to heaven. They believe the Bible. They believe the Word of God. But they have not the courage to boldly stand up and be identified as a child of God. If you have the idea somehow that you have the privilege or the choice to be a Christian... In secret, you're ignoring so much of what God's Word has to say about being a Christian. The Bible says to all Christians, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Bible says the redeemed of the Lord say so. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your God which is in heaven. Look, the 144,000... They might go through the tribulation. They go through the persecution of tribulation. They go through all the grief and troubles of the the tribulation with the mark of God. And therefore, they said, we belong to Jesus. And I wonder, are you too ashamed in this church age and the freedom we have as Americans to stand up for Jesus? Let me tell you something. I think that if God's people would determine to boldly, with the spirit of Jesus, wear the name of Jesus on their lives, boldly acknowledge the fact that they're born again, children of the Most High God. It would change the people you're around. It would change who you are. It would make a difference for the glory of the gospel. Be a witness. These 144,000, they boldly wore the name of Jesus. The second thing I want to emulate from the 144,000 They sing the song of the redeemed. Let me tell you something. When you've been saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have something to sing about. If you're here today and you know that Jesus has changed your life, you remember when God by His Spirit convicted you of your sin, you repented and asked Jesus to come into your heart, forgive your sin. And you remember the Lord changing your life. You're born again, saved. If you've been saved, let me tell you something, you've got reason to sing. You've got reason to praise the Lord. You've got reason, maybe not literally, but figuratively, to get out your harp and harp with harpers. Sing with loud voices like many waters that you've been saved. One way I know that my heart's in tune with the Lord is I catch myself singing by myself. Whistling as I go, singing praises to the Lord. In moments when I realize my heart's cold toward the Lord, I find myself in my spirit grumbling and growling and complaining. You know what? These 144,000, I don't see that it's necessarily prompted. But the 144,000, just because they would have been redeemed from the earth, they'd been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, they sang a song. 
But nobody else could even learn to sing. I think it's pretty exciting to see what the Bible says about that song. The Bible says in verse number 3 that in the middle of the verse, no man could learn that song but the 144,000. And I think, boy, what a sweet thing to be part of of such a special group that they had a song that only they could sing. And I'm not part of the 144,000, and you aren't either. But let me tell you something. I am part of the redeemed. I've been saved through faith in Jesus, and I've got all the reasons in the world to sing the praises of Jesus. They sang the song of the redeemed. Number three, they said no to idolatry. They said no to idolatry. We talk in length about This matter of idolatry. They were loyal and faithful to the Lord Jesus. They were not idolaters. Do you know that being an idolater does not necessarily mean that you bow to some idol. It doesn't mean necessarily that you've taken the mark of the beast. But being an idolater means that you worship something ahead of Or in front of the Lord Jesus himself. And I'm afraid that we're often idolaters. I think sometimes the idols of our life can be our children and grandchildren. I think sometimes the idols of our life can be the convenience of our lives. I think sometimes the idols of our lives can be our possessions and our jobs and our ambitions and our futures. The Bible says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The scripture says it like this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. What are we to do? I'm going to tell you. Like the 144,000. We are to be loyal and faithful. And chaste in our relationship to Jesus. He should be first. Number four. Look what the Bible says. I think this is important. We see it. The Bible says in verse number four. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. I love that phrase. They follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. What does the Bible say about these 144,000? Wherever he goes, they go. Are you following Jesus now, sometimes we say, I'm, are you a follower of Jesus? And, and it's almost like that's a big generic term. Like, yes, I am a follower of Jesus. I, I believe that Jesus is my Savior. I am a follower of Jesus. But let me ask you something. Are you following Jesus? D- did you follow Jesus today? D- did you follow his direction and his path for your life? Did, did you seek to even know what his path and will for your life was? Did you choose to live in sin? Did you choose to act in fear or faithlessness? We're to be followers of Jesus. Follow him. I love the word follow. It automatically implies that he's leading. I'm thankful to know that the Lord leads his people. And if you wonder what the next step of your life is, hey, just start following Jesus. He'll lead you where you need to go. They followed the lamb wherever he went. They followed the lamb wherever he went. The next question that we must ask is, are you willing to follow the lamb wherever he'd take you? Have you ever noticed that there are times in our lives where we get so ingrained in what we want that the thoughts of changing and not doing what we want Or being where we want to be. It's quite sickening. But I wonder, are you willing to say, Lord, here's my life. It's a blank sheet. Here's my life. Take it. Use it. Lord, if you want me to move, I'll move. Lord, if you want me to change my job, I'll change my job. Lord, if you want me to be faithful to church, I'll be faithful to church. Lord, if you want me... To say no to this, I'll say no to this. Lord, if you want me to say yes, I'll say yes. Lord, whatever you want. Are you willing to say, Lord, whatever you want? These folks, the 144,000, the Bible commends them and says, Hey, these are people who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Oh, may God help us to be those kinds of Christians. And finally, number five. 
Number five, the Bible says of these 144,000, verse five, in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. In their mouth was found no guile. I think it's kind of interesting that the Holy Spirit finds it important to emphasize that these faithful witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ, in their mouth was no guile. The word guile is deceit. No lying. Do you know what I'm noticing? I'm noticing that there's lots of Christians who excuse lying. We may not say and tell big, fat, bold lies. But them little lies, you know, them little white ones. Look, I'm going to tell you something. They're all black as the charred walls of hell. The Bible says that we're not to bear false witness. The Bible says that our yea is to be yea, our nay is to be We're to say yes and no. We're to be people who say what we mean and mean what we say, and our word is our bond. And I wonder, have you checked your mouth lately? <laughs> May God help us. The Bible says we're not to take the name of the Lord our God in vain. Now, our, our words and our mouths are important. I like to talk about this occasionally. We live and our culture has become a, a culture of lying, but also our culture has become a culture of just absolute filthy language. Have you noticed that? Oh, my lands. I mean, you can't go anywhere, do anything without people talking and cursing and filth. And perhaps you're one of these folks who you've allowed cursing, filthy language to creep into your vocabulary. I don't think that that pleases the Lord. As a matter of fact, I know it doesn't. And like the 144,000, may it be said of us that in our mouths is no guile. I'll never forget my grandfather. He used to tell me when someone would use bad language around me and I was a little boy, he's like, he's like, son, you know what people who cuss all the time, you know what that is? I said, no, sir, what is it? He said, that's just evidence that they've got a poor vocabulary. And I was like, I get it. I understand that. And, and maybe that's not necessarily true, but let me tell you something that is exactly true. It's exactly true. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And you know the saddest thing about a mouth that is rank with filth. You know the saddest thing about someone that has a mouth that is so nasty and full of filth and cussing and bitterness and anger. You know what's so sad about that mouth? It's not the mouth. Oh, how many times people say slip and say a cuss word. This happens to me every week. Someone slips and says something, uh, says some cuss word around me, the preacher, and they're like, oh. I shouldn't have said that around the preacher. The first thing I say is, don't worry about me. God's with you all the time. And it's kind of even humorous to me that folks are like, oh, I shouldn't say that around the preacher. As if for some reason my ears are so tender that if someone says a, a dirty word, it will hurt my little feelings. It don't, you know. I mean... I'm a preacher. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff I've heard. You cuss me all day, and you're not going to say anything I ain't heard before. Probably heard worse. But you know what hurts my feelings and breaks my heart? When folks have mouths full of filth, because I know they have hearts full of filth. May God help us. You see, the 144,000, God said about them, they said, look, 
And these guys' mouth is no guile. I don't know about you, but even in my, the preacher's life, there's some emphasis that I need to take home with me from the 144,000. I need to boldly wear the name of Jesus. I need to sing joyfully the song of the redeemed. I need to say no to idolatry and put Jesus first. I need to follow Jesus wherever he leads me. And I need to watch my mouth. I need to watch my mouth. And I need to keep my heart in tune with God. Oh, what a great, faithful Savior we have. He shows us a picture of the Lamb and the 144,000. And he gives us a little lesson. To prod us down the road and make us more like Christ. And more effective for eternity. Oh, may we take to heart the lesson that he's taught us.